Before we begin our message, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask now that you would uh, send your spirit, guide us, teach us, melt us, mold us. Give us what we don't have so that we can be better prepared to go out and share with others. Let the words that I speak here today not be mine. We ask always that they would be yours. We pray these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're up to Romans chapter 7, and I'm uh, titled this, The War Within. And I think as we read through this chapter, you'll understand uh, how appropriate that is. Uh, but just to recap, uh, some of the things that Pastor Chad talked about last week, because they're, they're essential, and you know, one of the things that's it's hard uh, for us as preachers, as teachers, uh, we're giving a flyover of Romans. There is so much in this one epistle that um, this letter is just so packed with information. Uh, and I wish that we had even more time, and hopefully in the future we will break it down into other parts. But uh, one of the things, uh, the concepts that Chad mentioned last week was justification. So remember that in justification, we are declared righteous. Uh, probably the simplest, easiest explanation is for anybody who's used a computer and Microsoft Word, if you want to get everything that's jumbled up on the page, justified, you hit that little button and whoop, all of a sudden it's straight, all the way down on both sides, right? It's like perfect alignment. That's the idea. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and I. He puts us back from a, a state of complete disarray, uh, out of being uh, out of step with God's will, putting us back. And this is justification. Remember that that is a one-time and permanent action, okay? And then there is sanctification, all right, so sanctification is the process of being made holy, more holy each and every day. This is an ongoing process. This is not a, a permanent one-time thing. This goes on throughout the entirety of our life until we uh, are given the gift of entering into heaven. And in theology, we say we then receive glorification. We receive our resurrected body. We're with God. And that's when we finally have been totally and entirely sanctified. That's a very important concept for us to understand. And when we are uh, sanctified, we are being made righteous. So justification declares our righteousness. Sanctification makes us righteous. In chapter 7, uh, we're going to look here. I want you to pay attention. Um, Paul uses the word know, K-N-O-W, to know at least six times in this passage. And you've heard me say before, if something's mentioned once in Scripture, we know it's important. Twice, it's very important. Three times, all right, well, now we're up to six. So why? Why is this so important? What does it mean? You know, this is not intellectual knowledge. Uh, for example, we know we've got the election coming up. I know who Donald Trump and Camilla Harris are. Okay, I know who they are, but I don't know them. Okay, not like I know family or I know my friends. That's more of an intimate knowledge, okay? So it's not an intellectual knowledge. This is a, this is a true understanding of a concept or a person knowing deep inside what is the truth about that person, thing, or subject that you're studying. It's a true, how appropriate for our church, heart knowledge, okay? So... You see, you're already on your way. Perfect. And let's remember what Paul said uh, two chapters ago when Pastor Chad was preaching Romans chapter 5, verse 1, when he said, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, until that time, we are in opposition to God. All right? So, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, we have been justified. We've been set straight. We've been put in a better relationship with God the way we're supposed to be moving in that direction. We're going to read uh, the first three verses here in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, starting verse 1. Do you not know 
brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still living, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So twice he says released from the law. You know, a lot of people misconstrue this passage. It's talking about divorce and, and actual marital relations. It's actually not, okay? Uh, this is one of those where you really have to kind of dig in, get your spade, dig in and find out what it was that Paul's trying to say because here he's talking about the fact that until we know God, until we know God, that true intimate understanding, we are slaves to sin. We are married to sin. All right? That's what we are bound to. All right? That is the problem. And what he points out here is that if the husband dies, okay? So he's talking about all contracts or covenants, if you will, are null and void upon death. Right? There's no reason for them to be carried on. We know that uh, throughout history, nations have made covenants with other nations. Those have been broken. As soon as the, the two parties who made it were dead and gone, the rest of them were like, okay, well, we're going to do things our way now. All right. So the idea here, again, is all contracts are null and void upon death. So let's go on to see maybe how he unpacks that a little bit further in the next three verses, four through six. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So again, released from the law. That means that through Christ, if we die with Christ, then we are no longer bound to the law. And uh, you'll hear this again later, but the idea of no longer, that's a permanent change in the Greek. That is why Paul uses these words. And, and you know, I, I think sometimes people think that uh, this, is, this is hard. You know, how am I supposed to know what the Greek is? I would really encourage you to buy a study Bible. Because in a study Bible, you're going to find that there are notes in there. And in those notes, they will give you the Greek and the, and the Hebrew, like definitions of those words, and it'll really help you begin to, as I said earlier, know and understand God's word. And, you know, once sin is put to death, we're no longer bound to that, and what? Then we are free to be married again, right? That's what Paul's analogy was. Who are we going to be married to? Well, hopefully you're going to figure that out, that that's being married to God, all right? We turn to God and love, not sin and death. All right. Listen to what Paul said in last week's reading, Romans chapter 6, verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And then he went on in verse 17 of chapter 6 and says, But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. So you see, there is a change within us when we come to know Christ. We don't necessarily understand that, and Paul's going to talk about some of that in the upcoming verses here. But I love the fact that he used that word, you know, allegiance, okay? We are, uh, uh, you know, allegiant. We always used to say the pledge of allegiance, right? Uh, to the flag, we're, we're, we're stating that this is what we will follow. Well, until we came to know God, the only thing we 
we followed, and we didn't even really know it, to be honest with you, was sin. Okay, that is, that's the matter of fact thing about our lives, okay? Until we come to know Christ, we don't even know that that's going on in our life. Listen to it as he says now in verses 7 through 10. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what, is, what sin is had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. Well, that's pretty clear. We should go on, right? <laughs> this is a tough chapter, and these are tough things to read through. But hopefully, these little things, these little snippets in between will help you begin to parse that out and see the things that Paul was saying. First, I want you to, to realize, did you notice that he made a change there in the very first verse, and he started using the personal pronoun, I. You see, Paul, a lot of times people think Paul is just blanketly throwing things out there as rules, and they didn't apply to him. No, they didn't read the book of Romans, because Paul, in this chapter especially, bears his soul. He lets everyone know that he's just as big a sinner as anybody else, okay? So very important that. Now, when he says seizing sin, seizing the opportunity, and you're going to hear that a couple of times in this passage, so it's important to understand that, you know, in the Greek, uh, this is uh, the idea of a starting place. So sin had a starting place within us, okay? And um, one of my favorite theologians and preachers that I like to listen to is John MacArthur. And I, and I wrote down this because I thought this was such a great way of describing that word in Greek. To seize the opportunity means that that is now, as uh, John MacArthur says, the base camp of operations from which to conduct evil work. Okay? The base camp from which to conduct evil work. You know, the law is like a mirror. Uh, if you study theology, you'll know that you'll hear uh, Luther talking about that. But what does a mirror do for us? A mirror reflects what we would not otherwise see, right? I mean, do you know what you look like? You don't, right? Unless you look into something that is going to give you a reflection of your image. Okay, so without that, you don't know what your image is. You don't really know what you look like, you know, um, you don't know if your hair is all out of sorts, right? Is it? No, never mind, just kidding. A little short, yeah. So, you know, really what the law does for you and I, you know, sooner or later I'm going to do this, he gives you a spiritual refraction. Okay? When I see a patient who comes to me and they've never worn glasses, I do their exam, I do a refraction, I find that they have what we call a refractive error, okay? Their eye is not perfectly focusing light on the back of the eye so that they get the clearest possible image. I give them glasses or contacts and correct that image. And I will tell you that over the more than 30 years that I've been in this field, I have had numerous people come back to me and say, you ruined my eyes. I can't see without these glasses now. My eyes are worse. And I have, to so, I have to show them that actually they're reading the very same thing they did when they came in. It's just when they put the glasses on, they read even better. I said, the problem is this. I said, up until that time, all they knew, the only thing their brain knew was what they saw, right? When I put those glasses on them, all of a sudden their brain just went, whoa, is that what it's supposed to look like? <laughs> now, what used to be acceptable is no longer acceptable, okay? I will never forget the day I drove home the first time I had glasses. 
I did not know you were supposed to see individual leaves from that far away, right? That's what this is. That's what the law does for you and I. It helps us to see sin in our life for what it really is. Because until that time, we didn't know that's what it was. And that's what it's doing to us, okay? It's taken us down. But now God's provided that ability to refract our spiritual nature so that we really see what the truth is. Listen to what Paul says in the upcoming chapter. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because Pastor Chad will next week. But in verses 13 and 14 of Romans 8, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And then Paul also said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You see, the law teaches us what is right and wrong. We have, um, it teaches us that we have a choice. All right, until, until that refraction has taken place, we didn't know we have a choice. We only know to keep doing one thing. But now, all of a sudden, the door's been opened wide. Now you can see, you, oh, this is like a T intersection. I don't have to just keep going one direction. I can go the other. Which one am I going to choose? All right, that's, that's what we need to understand is now God is presenting us with a choice. We don't have to just keep following what sin would incline us to do. Let's go on, starting at verse 11. For sin, here we go, seizing the opportunity, remember that's that base camp of uh, starting point, all right? For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. So before coming into this relationship with God, we have always seen or viewed, if you will, the law as what society kind of teaches today, right? That's, you don't want to do that. That's so constraining. Be free to do whatever you want to do because that's where you're going to find true happiness. That's where you're going to find fulfillment. You see, that's sin's lie. The enemy, Satan, does not want you to know the truth. And as long as he can keep you diverted long enough until your earthly body gives out, he wins. Jesus Christ came to say, no, that's not what that's going to be. Sin's lie is to uh, tell you, you know, everything is, you know, 50 shades of gray, right? Isn't that today's culture? You know, what does scripture teach us? It's black and white. There is right and wrong. Scripture is truth, regardless of what society wants to say. You see, people are, are caught in this where they haven't had that spiritual refraction. They don't even know right now that they're following what sin just keeps leading them down the path. And what's that going to lead to? It's going to lead to death. But not just physical death. Here Now we're talking about spiritual death. And what is that? That is eternal separation from God. Forever. Never having another shot at getting back into a relationship with God. This life is the only time we have that opportunity. And sin does not want people to know that. 
through the law, we understand and recognize that we need to repent. And, you know, that word in Greek means a literal physical turning around and going the other direction. Remember, now we understand we have two choices. We choose that other direction. And in the process, through Jesus Christ, we also die to sin. That's the way in which we're made alive. But we have to be willing to acknowledge that sin exists in our life first. Listen to what the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him, meaning God and Jesus Christ, make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. You see, that's what sin wants. He wants to turn us away from God. He doesn't want us to see that we can be saved. That's what Satan uses that tool in our life. And Paul is trying to point out to us how that is going on. So listen in these next six verses what he says about that. Starting in verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that Good itself does not dwell in me, that it is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, It is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Well, that was clear. (laughs) I can't believe I got through that without tripping up. Um, Thank you, God. Um, So Paul here defines for us what I, I put as a title for this message, The War Within. Did you hear the the conflict that he was explaining that he goes through? Okay? Every one of us goes through this. You know, don't think for a moment that the day you're saved that you have been entirely sanctified, meaning you lead a sinless life. Not true. This very passage teaches that this war is going to go on even though God has refracted that spiritual nature and we see what is the right thing to do, there's still a lot of times we still don't do it. In fact, we have um, this innate, twisted bent in our life to do what we know we're not supposed to do. Right? Like a sign that says, do not enter. You know? I, my son said to me one time, he goes, you know, I see that. You know what it makes me want to do? I go, oh, don't say it. He goes, yeah, I just want to go right in through that doorway. I'm like, yeah, gee, you know. How many people are like that, all right? They're told not to do something, and it's like it's a magnet. We're drawn to doing bad, to doing the wrong thing, and that is the, that is the physical, or when you read in this chapter, anytime he uses the word flesh, that is sarkos, in Greek. That is about the physical nature, the the sinful, fallen part of us. But there is a soul, our spirit, okay? Those are the two natures, and that's at war within. That's what's going on within you and I right now. Uh, Listen to what Paul defines that as in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, 
in the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. There it is, okay? God puts it as plain as it can be. There are two directions, two options. He gives us free will. He allows us to choose. He does not turn us into little puppets or robots the day we come to receive the gift of grace in Jesus Christ. He wants us to willingly follow him, to die to our sin. Let's read the remaining verses in this chapter, verses 21 to 25. So I find the law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. You know, when Paul says, you know, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me? You know, that is a Greek term uh, that was used by soldiers when they would run back into the battle to save a fallen comrade who's been wounded to grab them and to drag them back to safety. Okay? That's the picture. That's the mental word picture Paul's trying to draw for you here. And I love the fact that says, what a wretched man I am. The, you know, that, that conflict, that war that's going on but in, within him. I'm sure every one of you, like me, has gone through that. You know, you know not to do it, and you do it, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, why did I do that? Okay? We fight that constantly, but that is the battle, and God recognizes that. He wants us to know that. Okay? And when we recognize that, he wants us to turn back to him. Now, this is an interesting thing, because when he says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Now, Elizabeth and I were talking about this yesterday, but in ancient Tarsus, the rulers there came up with a, uh, a punishment for someone who committed murder. They would literally take the murdered body, the corpse, and they would attach it to the person's back, bare skin to bare skin. And their sentence was to carry that corpse for the rest of their life. Now, that corpse over time becomes rotted, becomes putrid. The bacteria eat from the corpse into the host body, become one with it, until finally it continues to eat through and causes that person's death. That is what sin is like for you and I. That is what's on our back. But Jesus Christ is the one who cuts that free through his death. And praise God is right. That is a picture that's an ugly, horrible picture, but it's an awesome thing for us to understand if it gets the point across. That's what we need to divest ourselves of. That's what we want to lose. That's how ugly sin is in our life. So if I look at this passage now and all these little steps along the way, what is Paul really saying? What's he trying to lead us to? How can we apply this? Okay, because every time I read scripture, that's always, for me, that's the final question. Okay, so what do I do with this? How do I take this with me? First, we have to acknowledge that sin is real and that it is real in my life. Okay. That doesn't mean you guys all point, yeah, it's in his life. <laughs> okay. Live remembering that through Jesus Christ you are justified, you have been made right with God, 
You are sanctified. You are being made righteous with God until you're going to receive your glorified presence with the Lord. Okay? God's promises are eternal. God does not lie. All right? Receive the gift of Jesus Christ. How we need to repent. Right? That's the first thing. Turn around and go the other way. Even if you find yourself in the midst of doing it again, stop. You can turn around and go the other direction. All right? Repent. Ask for forgiveness. Receive God's grace and his mercy. And go back at it again. And again. And again. You know... This is the season of the Olympics, right? I love when the Olympics are on. When I get the chance, I didn't this week because I was preparing for this, so I shut everything else down, but I become an Olympics junkie when it's on. I love watching what those young people have accomplished, what the level of expertise they have for their particular event is, they're the best in the world. Okay, and now they're competing to see who might for a day, because that's all it is, even for a moment, really, that they're number one. And that's an awesome accomplishment. But how do they get there? How do they get there? They practice and practice and practice until they don't get it wrong. Soldiers, military people, all of you who served know this. When you went through boot camp, they made you do something over and over and over again. How about just marching? Remember how it was when you first were the group that marched? You guys were all over the place, right? How about graduation day? Every heel hit at exactly the same time. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Every step is in time. Why? Because they practiced until they didn't get it wrong. That's this life. We've got to keep doing it over and over again. God gives us that opportunity. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it for, to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Dearly beloved, we are in a battle. Every single day, there is a war going on within us. Stay the course. Start your morning before you even swing your legs out of bed and put on the full armor of God. Read Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20. Memorize that. Say it over and over again. Put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, your feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Take up the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith. Say that every morning. God, clothe me in this, because it's going to be a battle. Don't think for a minute it won't be. And you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. You're going to have days where you really did great and other days where you stumbled. But don't quit. Keep fighting. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. I want all of us to be able to say this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now... There is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed 
for his appearing. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, thank you for the many, many lessons you have in Scripture, especially this, which so vividly portrays the battle that we face each and every day. Thank you for putting it there because it says that you recognize the battle that we have to fight each day. But also, you promise us in Scripture that you will be there, that you will clothe us in that armor, and that you will be our rear guard. We ask that now, and we ask that you would help turn our spirit, Lord, to be in concert with yours. We ask and pray all of these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we have the great blessing of being able to gather around the Lord's table and celebrate communion, which the Lord himself instituted on the final night that he was with his disciples. They had their meal, and uh, they had supper, and then Jesus instituted something. And when we celebrate this, we want people to know, both here and who may be joining us online, if you are an active, professing believer in Jesus Christ, an active member of a church somewhere, you are welcome to participate with us. This, is, this table is open to you. It is through these elements that may feed and nourish our physical body that they represent what God is doing for us spiritually when we obey his commandment, when he said to do this in remembrance of me. On that night, Jesus celebrated that meal, and then at that meal he took bread and he gave thanks, and then he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup Again, he blessed it, and he said, Take, drink, this is my body which is poured out for the remission of all your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And often, as often as we eat this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. I'm going to invite you to come forward. We'll start, I think, over this end uh, with Jim will come by rows. Come up, please take the elements back to your seat with you, and we will all partake together. So, come, for all things are ready. Rise for God's parting charge and benediction. Now as you go forth from this place, know that the living God goes before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, above you to watch over you, alongside of you to befriend you, and inside of you to give you his peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore. And let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.